Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. It was that time of the year again, my visit to my summer home in Nikina. Being where I grew up, I made a point to visit at least once a year to go camping, fishing, and enjoy the lush forests and lakes. It started off as every other trip did, but finished unexpectedly. I drove into town, musing, blaring loudly, as my girlfriend and I sang along to the lyrics we knew by heart. We turned down the side road, leading to the subdivision, where our house resided. Seeing the playground there brought back many fond memories from when I was younger. We pulled into the driveway, and I started to unpack everything while my girlfriend went into the house to air out the plate. I brought in our suitcases and set them at the top of the stairs, making my way behind my girlfriend, looking out the large front window. I wrapped my arms around her and kissed her head. I could feel her smile as she grabbed my arm. We spoke for a bit to make plans on what we were going to do before splitting off. I chose to run to the northern store in town to pick up some things while she would stay at the house and tidy up. It took a minute to drive there as the wave after wave of nostalgia ran over me. An old restaurant I would hang out at, the train station cafe, and many others. I walked into the northern where I was greeted by an old friend of my grandfather's. My grandfather spent most of his life there. And that was the main reason why I was there as well. The friend recognized me from a few years back and asked how I was doing and wanted to know what I had been up to. I explained how I was going camping up on Stinger Lake. It was my favorite place to fish growing up. He told me a story about when he was younger and driving down the road that led to Stinger. He was going fast but he was sure he saw a Sasquatch. I thought it was crazy, but said how cool that was and that I would keep my eyes open. We said farewell, and I went back to shopping. It didn't take me long to get everything before I went back home. After I got back, I brought everything into the house, kissed my girlfriend, and headed back out to get the boat into the back of the truck. Luckily, the small 12-footer we used was light, and I had no problem lifting it in and strapping it down. I put in the gas tank and motor before going in and grabbing all our stuff to bring it out. Once everything was loaded, we locked the house again and shot off towards our launch site. It was a bit of a drive, but with the windows down and more music, it felt quick. We arrived and backed down the slope, getting out. I unstrapped the boat and slid it off the truck and into the river. 
my girlfriend parked the truck off to the side as I got everything ready. My girlfriend came down, hopped into the boat, and I pushed us off, jumping in. The short trip through the river was one of the stinger's best qualities. All the lush greenery untouched by anyone. We reached the mouth of the river, marked by two trees crossed over. As soon as we cleared it, I lowered the engine fully into the water and we took off. It was around a 30-minute boat ride to our usual campsite. We saw a couple of moose, a cow, and a calf along the way. But otherwise, we simply enjoyed the sun and wind. I cut the engine as we reached our destination. Jumping to the front of the boat and out, I pulled it up onto the shore, tying it to a tree so that it wouldn't just go off leaving us stranded. We quickly got everything out of the boat and started setting up camp. I left my girlfriend with the tent and took out the tarp. There were boards nailed to trees to set up a roof over where we kept the food and many gas stove. Once that was hanging, I helped finish up the tent and we started a small fire. We grabbed some hot dogs and decided to roast some for lunch. While we were sitting beside the fire, we heard rustling in the bushes behind us. We both turned around quickly and peered into the brush, but whatever made the sound must have gone away quickly since we weren't able to see anything aside from trees and darkness. We didn't think too much of it and turned back toward the fire, finishing up our lunch and putting everything away. It was around 2 p.m. at this point and my girlfriend wanted to go fishing. Now that the camp was fully set up, I had no problem with that, and we hopped back into the boat. Stinger is a relatively shallow lake, and the best way to fish there was to trawl. So we got out further on the lake. I put the motor on low, and we began casting out lines. Lady Luck was always on my girlfriend's side when we fished together, and that time was no different. To every one fish I caught, my girlfriend would catch three. We kept a few to have supper tonight, but most were tossed back, taking lots of photos. My girlfriend kissing the first, as was the ritual. As the sun began to lower on the horizon, my girlfriend started to get tired, so we decided to call it quits. When we made it back to shore, I tied up the boat, lifted my girlfriend, and brought her to the tent. I kissed her and told her she could nap while I cleaned the fish and prepared dinner. She smiled told me she loved me before settling in. I closed the tent and went back to the boat to collect the fish. I grabbed the fillet knife out of my bag and made quick work of the fish. I put the perfect fillets onto a plate and made sure to toss the entrails into the lake. It was the best way to keep wild animals like bears away. I cleaned the blood from the board and grabbed my fish batter. I filled a pot with some cooking oil and began properly coating the fillets as I waited for the oil to start boiling. Once it did, I tossed in the fillets and put some rice on to cook as well. To finish, it didn't take long for both to finish, adding a few more logs on the fire and making up the plates of food. It was seven by this point, and I went to wake my girlfriend, slowly stirring her awake with a kiss on the head. I gave our usual good morning sleepyhead greeting before stepping back out. As I was stretching from being crouched down, I couldn't help but notice a fallen tree off to the side of the camp heading inland. I didn't notice it before, and upon closer inspection, it looked as though something had pushed it over. I tried looking deeper in, but with the sun mostly gone, it was impossible to see anything. I heard movement at the tent and turned around. I made my way over and passed my girlfriend a plate, enjoying the flaky taste of fresh fish it had been too long since I'd enjoyed this and savored every bite. Once we were finished eating, we tossed our paper plates into the fire and shuffled closer together. I wrapped my arm around my girlfriend's shoulder. We sat like that and listened to the soft sounds of nature as the sun finally vanished for the day, leaving nothing but the small circle of light from the fire and the pitch darkness beyond. I kissed her head and suggested we settle in for the night, 
pouring some water into the fire. I made sure everything was properly packed up and crawled in after her. We had set up a sleeping bag on the ground as cushioning, another on top of the blanket, getting into my pajamas. I crawled in next to my girlfriend and wrapped my arms around her. I wished her a good night, and we both slowly drifted off, cuddling in each other's arms. A loud rustling woke me up. I could feel my girlfriend still breathing steadily in her sleep, and so I checked my watch. It was two in the morning. I looked around the tent, and that is when I heard it again. Loud rustling just outside the tent. A bear, I thought to myself, and tried to take some deep breaths to calm my heart. But I failed to do so as the rustling got louder. I refused to move. Each passing moment felt like a lifetime. I heard my girlfriend grumble, but, and thought she had woken. But when I checked, she was still asleep. At this point, the rustling was right outside our tent. Whatever it was, I could hear its breathing. Each breath labored and heavy as I heard some brush up against the tent, waiting for it to break in as it stopped. But after what felt like forever, it finally stepped away, and I could hear it rummaging through the camp. I watched as something solid hit the tent, making me jump. The jump caused my girlfriend to stir awake, and I quickly put my hand over her mouth to stop her from saying anything. I whispered softly that something was outside, and she must have heard it as well, since she stopped moving. It continued to make a ruckus for a bit longer before it finally left. I sighed in relief and finally let go of my girlfriend. She turned to me and asked me what that was. I told her I didn't know, but most likely a bear, since they weren't uncommon in these parts of the woods. We laid there in silence and listened in case it came back, but as the sun began to rise, there were no more incidents. I slowly opened the zipper to the front door once it was bright enough for us to see without issue, popping my head out of the hole. I looked around the camp, but didn't see anything amiss aside from our food being tossed all over. I opened the door the rest of the way and crawled out of the tent, searching as I took a better look around. The cooler holding all of our food was opened. The lid tossed far to the side. Most of the food was out and tossed all over the place. A lot of the meat we brought, like sausages and bacon, were gone. The heavy thing that hit the tent before was a pack of hot dogs, left relatively untouched. I checked that the water was fine and gave the okay for my girlfriend to come out. She crawled out shortly after and saw the mess. She helped me collect everything and clean up. We checked everything, and luckily a lot had been tossed aside was still good to use and eat. I put a kettle on to boil and sat down with my girlfriend to discuss what we wanted to do. Bears were in the area, but if we were careful, they weren't a threat, so we could stay. But if she didn't want to, I was okay with heading back. I heard the kettle go off and got up, making some tea. I passed a mug of it to my girlfriend and waited for her choice. After some thought, we decided to give it one more day, and then we would cut the trip a day short. We had traveled so far to do this, it would be a waste to cut the trip so short. I kissed her head and nodded before getting back to grab some wood, leaving her to drink her tea. I did a quick walk around along the edge of the clearing and collected some sticks. When I got to the section where the tree had been knocked over, I noticed that it had been moved from where it was before. I put my hand on it and crouched down to look at the ground. It was soft and muddy, easy to leave print, and what I saw made my blood run cold. Instead of bear paws, like I was expecting, I saw large, human-shaped feet, much bigger than I'd ever seen before. The distinct imprint of toes clearly visible in the deep imprints. I shot up and looked around into the forest, but didn't see anything aside from the trees. I quickly walked back to where my girlfriend was, putting away her cup, and I told her that I felt perhaps 
it was better to go back today. After everything that happened, I didn't want to risk anything happening to her. She asked me what was wrong, and so I brought her over to the imprint, telling her about what my grandfather's friend told me about seeing Sasquatch around here a few years back. She laughed, asking if I was playing a joke on her. Her reasoning was that Sasquatch was always spotted deep in the state, never in northern Ontario. I shook my head, telling her it wasn't a joke. She looked partially confused at first, then slowly nodded, agreeing with me that we should head back. My girlfriend quickly got to work on packing up all the food and cooking items we brought, while I worked on emptying the tent before taking it down. As I was finishing up on the tent, we both heard rustling off to our right in the direction of the fallen tree. We both stopped what we were doing and turned toward the sound. It was hard to see deep into the brush, and I thought it was nothing before spotting movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to look at it and urged my girlfriend to start loading things onto the boat. I could hear her behind me continuing to keep a close eye where I saw the movement. I didn't see anything else moving and slowly stood up. I grabbed the tent bag and took a step back. I felt a hand on my arm and jumped in fear, whirling around. I saw my girlfriend, who said the boat was full and ready. I took her hand and started to walk toward the boat when I was stopped by my girlfriend's face. It had gone completely pale, looking at something behind me. I slowly turned, and what I saw, I will never forget. A man, but much taller than any man I had ever seen, covered in thick fur. Its face distorted like a cross between a bear and a monkey, with long, sharp teeth and deep brown eyes. I sucked in a breath and slowly began backing away, pulling my girlfriend along and trying not to make any sudden movement. I quickly checked behind me and noticed we were so close to the boat. Turning back toward the creature, it had taken a step forward, now in the clearing with us. Luckily, it was still only watching. As I began untying the boat, my girlfriend climbed in. I put the tent down gently and gave the boat a soft push. It barely budged. I silently cursed and took a deep breath. I silently counted to three, still watching the creature before turning and pushing as hard as I could. The boat slid free of the ground and into the water. I leapt into the boat as I heard the creature start running towards us. I grabbed the paddle and with a few heavy strokes pushed us a good ways away from the shoreline. I turned and looked back. The creature stopped at the edge of the water and screeched at us. It sounded like nails on a chalkboard. I began putting the cord to start the engine. First try, nothing. Second try, still nothing. I grabbed the small pump on the gas hose and pumped it a few times. I heard a splash to our left. The creature tried to throw a stick at us, but luckily it landed in the water. The third try finally brought the engine to life. I quickly turned it to full throttle as my girlfriend and I took off down the lake. We sat in silence until we reached the boat launch. I got out and pulled the boat up, checking on my girlfriend, who was still shaken up, but otherwise fine. We quickly got the truck loaded and drove back to town. On our drive, we decided to tell everyone we called the trip early because of a bear. Who would believe us if we told them we saw Bigfoot? We spent the rest of our vacation at the house, not going out for anything aside from trips to the store and the library to rent a couple of movies. We went back home not long after and never again brought it up until now. Ever since then, we have never gone back to Stinger Lake, still taking our yearly trips to Nenka, but always staying at the house. On to the next one. In Oklahoma County in Oklahoma, on this occasion, there had been a big snowstorm and nothing was moving on the street. There weren't even any tire tracks 
I was about 15 years old and worked at a fast food restaurant about a mile north of this location and was forced to walk home because my father had called and told me that the conditions were so bad he couldn't get the car out of the drive. The heavy blanket of snow made visibility good, reflecting light as it does. As I cleared some trees to the east, I observed movement to my left through peripheral vision and looked to my left in the ravine and saw a figure apparently playing in the snow. For an instant, I thought it was a child wearing a dark-colored snowsuit, but as the moment passed, I became very aware that this was no child. I had a very clear view of it and could see that it was black or was very close to black and covered with long hair or fur from head to toe. It was probably around five feet tall and weighed about 160 pounds. The creature continued playing in the snow, bending over at the waist and throwing snow up into the air with both hands in a wide hooping motion, throwing it up so that it came back down on its head. It also began rolling in the snow. I felt dark terror at the sight of this thing. I was also very unnerved knowing I was very far from any residential area in the early morning and that there was absolutely no traffic on the road. The creature was only about 30 to 35 yards from me, and I had to be about an eighth of a mile to clear until I was out of sight of the creature. I thought about running, but feared that my footfall and rapid motion would catch the thing's attention and that it would then begin chasing me, as is instinctive for a lot of animals. The point is, I had quite a bit of time to view this thing, and the longer I looked at it, the more I realized what I was looking at did not fit any rational explanation. Once I was out of sight, and I thought I was out of earshot, I ran as far and as fast as I could. There is an area now a park, half a park, but at the time, nothing was there but a wooded area and the ravine, which is a drainage ditch. Even now, with the park, there is still a good deal of wooded area. David A. Ferris, author of Mysterious Oklahoma, says that locals have dubbed this creature the Skunk Ape, reportedly because of its terrible odor. I did not smell anything in this incident, but I have a very poor sense of smell and serious sinus and allergy problems, which are routinely exacerbated by cold weather. The sighting was between 1.30 and 2.30 a.m. It was heavy, heavy snowfall, enough to stop traffic on the roadway. The blanket of snow added visibility by reflection. It was very cold, of course, just off of a four-lane roadway. At the time, no residences or businesses were within about a mile except to the north. The area to the east of the roadway was a creek or drainage ditch becoming a wooded area a short distance from the roadway. To the west, a field and a wooded area beyond. A shopping center to the north, about a half a mile. The area where the creature was actually standing was a creek bottom, rarely filled with much water. I have heard accounts of other smaller statured Bigfoot or skunk ape, but the closest sighting I know of were in El Reno. I remember seeing a story about these creatures on a local television news broadcast a couple of years after this incident but can't remember many details. On to the next one. Oklahoma Township people wonder if Creature is a Bigfoot. What has reddish-brown hair, stands a stocky four to five feet high, and smells like a sewer? That's what some folks around here would like to know. Billy Perry, a 15-year-old high school freshman, says he saw such a creature while scouting for coyote tracks along Trail Creek near his home south of Vichy. His family says it prowled on their property and near their house for more than a month this winter. Hair samples found by Perry's house were sent to Hayden Hughes, director of Sasquatch Investigations of Mid-America. Was it from a Bigfoot? The hair samples looked very interesting. At this point, we cannot confirm what kind of animal it came from, Hughes said, adding a sample was being forwarded to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation Forensic Lab in hope of analysis. I feel it's a matter of time before a Bigfoot is captured alive, Hugh says. Dewey County Sheriff Larry Pike, on the other hand, says he has heard only rumors about the strange animal, but nothing official. 
sightings also have been reported near Roger Mills County. Search parties were formed after similar sightings of an unidentified creature were reported in eastern Oklahoma near Bristow and Stirwell. Nothing was found. Beachy is in Dewey County. On to the next one. I was out with my fraternity camping near the Illinois River. It was around early October. We were in a small clearing near the river under a small hill. There were several of us in the group. Me and two of my friends walked into the tree line under the hill to gather some firewood for the campfire. It was dark and we only had one flashlight. As we gathered wood, up on the side of the hill, something started rustling through the trees. The hill was thickly covered in sumac, which would be very difficult to navigate, especially in the dark. Whatever was on the hill started approaching us, maybe about a hundred feet away. It was starting to break some of the branches in the sumac and sounded big. We couldn't see anything through the dense brush, but whatever it was was coming towards us. One of my friends picked up a rock and threw it toward whatever was making the noise. It stopped just momentarily, then began running in our direction. At that, we got scared and ran back to the campfire where the rest of the members were. None of the rest of our fraternity members heard anything. We thought they may have been trying to prank us, but all said they'd been right there waiting for us to bring back wood. We all decided to end our outing and got into the vehicle and headed back to campus. This is about the best I can remember what happened. It's been many years ago now. The only other thing I can remember right now is that there was a musty smell about the time whatever it was started walking down the hill. It smelled like dead fish in stagnant water. I'm no expert in sound, but whatever was rustling was making footfalls that sounded bipedal. We were looking for firewood. We stayed fairly close, and since we only had one flashlight, we'd walked away about 300 yards from our other fraternity members into the tree line and were out of sight of them. I don't think we could hear them because of the river running. It had just rained quite a bit and the river was full. It was around 10 p.m., a clear night with no moon. Very dark, but the stars were out. It was calm winds and cool, probably in the 50s. It was a flat area near the river. However, the hill was close by within about 300 feet. It was probably within a half to one mile of farms and houses nearby. One of my other fraternity, one of my other fraternity members, he didn't gather wood with us, had told us that when he and his brother were younger, they lived further up the river about seven miles in the woods. One night when his parents were gone, he and his brother were at home and something started banging on the side of their house. They were too afraid to go and look. When their parents got back, they told of what happened and their dad went outside and found some large bare footprints around the house. They were going to take pictures the next morning, but it rained and washed the prints away. On to the next one. What are we to make of ape men who share more with the imaginal realm than our reality? To me, that appears to firmly be an impossibility said Fred Back witness of the famed Ape Canyon incident when asked of Bigfoot physical existence. Beck, along with several other miners, allegedly had their cabin besieged by a group of at least six Bigfoot in 1924. Beck was told by a First Nations informant that Bigfoot were not like a man and not like a spirit, but in between. Beck wrote, Material things usually make a big splash in the material world, and spiritual things often do not make a ripple there. Why? We can give proof of a phenomenon, but its nature is immersed in the spiritual and can only be explained by laws of the spiritual. The abominable snowmen are from a lower plane. When the condition and vibration is at a certain frequency, they can easily, for a time, appear in a very solid body. They are not animal spirits, but also lack the intelligence of human consciousness. When reading of evolution, we have read many times conjecture about the missing link between man and the anthropod ape. 
The snowmen are a missing link in the consciousness, neither animal nor human. They are very close to our dimension and yet are part of the lower one. Could they be the missing link man has been so long searching for? The human soul once dwelling in a spiritual body and eventually incarnated at the fall of man into bodies like we have now. The beings we call abominable snowmen were not of the necessarily high development to incarnate in human form. They had not reached that scale of spiritual evolution. They are the easiest beings materialized as evidenced by the many reports of their appearances to more people in recent years. In fact, if the vibratory influence right for them is present, they can manifest without any human being present at all. This accounts for the many tracks being seen along the mountain ranges of the West Coast and Canada. All life has some order of consciousness. Someone might call the snowmen a delayed race, awaiting for the highest expression of consciousness. That is the human consciousness. They seem to be curious about human beings more than anything else, and I think it possible as time passes that they will manifest further and further away from mountain ranges, which has been their natural, attractive habitat. And the time may come when you hear stories from cities of people seeing strange, hairy-like creatures. This is a distinct possibility. Just four days ago, I received a letter from a friend from Seattle, Washington, and in it she told me of a lady who just recently had seen an abominable snowman right on the outskirts of Yakima, Washington. And as the letter stated, it was in or near her yard. Many of Beck's ideas, especially the oblique references to the man's role in manifesting Sasquatch, call to mind the co-creation hypothesis proposed by author Greg Bishop. While his model has strong anecdote in all anomalous studies, Bishop is actively attempting to bring the concept into the 21st century. Combining the concept with information theory and other cutting-edge scientific hypotheses. Of UFO encounters featuring high strangeness, Bishop says, These cases evidence almost none of the normal element of a supposed abduction or what we have become used to as the standard alien. But they are only very rarely mentioned in surveys and research, mainly because they both don't make any sense and because they don't fit comfortably into a standard narrative. Many UFO researchers would be tempted to say that these accounts are either faulty recollections that would fit a humanoid narrative if given enough questioning or screen memories imposed by aliens, but perhaps extra human consciousness has no need or method to impose any mind control on us. We have our own built-in screen memories that function quite well in earthly situations such as childhood trauma. How much do we bring to the dance during a paranormal encounter? In other words, how much of the UFO experience is the result of our subconscious mind trying to make sense of the unexplained, startling, and or frightening input, and leaving us with an insane placeholder when it can't decide on anything else. Bishop conceived this idea in a ufologist context primarily as a new means of thinking about nonsensical UFO encounters and green memories a process where false memories are allegedly implanted by alien abductors to prevent witnesses from fully recalling their experiences. Example being, an alien might be remembered as an owl, an alien medical examination as a dentist visit, and so on and so forth. The co-creation hypothesis is equally useful when considering old fairy tales of glamour. The folkloric ability to appear or make things appear completely different than their true nature. In this fashion, fairies effectively shapeshift dank, dreary caves into beautiful fairy places, or presented twigs, worms, and dirt as delicious food. In Bishop's model, something a non-human other appears to a witness, and our own preconceptions and biases shape what we see. This concept finds strength in other paranormal disciplines, 
It is not uncommon if unreported four out of a group of, say, five individuals, three people to see a UFO in the sky while the other two see nothing. Equally problematic are sightings where all five witnesses see a bright light in the sky, yet they disagree on crucial aspects such as the object's behavior or color. This strongly indicates individual sensitivities, perceptions, etc. are at play in every numinous encounter. This discrepancy appears in the mid-1990s sighting of a witness named Gage near Hillsborough, Oregon. As a young man, Gage and two friends were traipsing around through the woods near their home when they noticed a foreboding sensation pervading the forest. The sky visibly darkened, perhaps only a cloud, perhaps something more sinister, and the area fell deathly silent. Rounding a bend in the trail, the trio saw a fallen tree upon which sat a big white thing. An errant beam of sunshine broke the cloud and shone upon the creature, which jumped from the highest point of the log to the ground, prompting them to flee. Gage later described the beast as tall and covered in medium-length hair with creamy tan skin. It was built like a bodybuilder and appeared somewhere between a man and a gorilla. He and his friends got the impression that the being was not natural, but more supernatural. However, one of Gage's friends later claimed that he never saw it, while the other witness, described as living a troubled home life at the time of the incident, reached out to Gage in 2019 with another discrepancy. Not only did he interpret the beast as a malevolent wood spirit, but he said the creature was black, dark, dark black. Both remained steadfast with their description. Faulty recall racked by two decades of rewritten memories? A disagreement in a shared lie by three kids? whose narrative has begun to unravel into adulthood? Or is the appearance of the paranormal as obliquely suggested such physics theories as the observer effect dependent upon the witness? How can we ever hope to measure phenomena that defy our eyes, our most trusted means of navigating reality? If our eyes can be deceived, can our trusted scientific instruments be fooled as well? Right, chaos magician and author Gordon White. Could you measure the tidal flow of Sydney Harbor's mouth in your kitchen sink? With the right expensive equipment, you could potentially measure the moon's impact on gravity, influencing a tiny rise in your water, and then blow those numbers up to an estimated volume of the harbor that evening and subtract the difference between your high and low estimates. Sounds horrible, right? Welcome to Psy Research. What you should actually do is have a team at the harbor mouth with some far cheaper equipment. It is an in-field experiment. The tide happens to a harbor, not a sink, and anyone wishing to criticize your result will say so. When seeking the truth behind paranormal phenomena, perhaps our most useful tool remains, as it has always been our conscious. It is certainly the message passed down to us through time, a position championed by every culture from the Australian Aborigines to the Kelty fairy faith of the New Age channelers. It is only our modern culture, the industrialized, materialist, reductionist, Western world, smothered in concrete, glass, and steel, that has ever actively sought to discredit and disregard this crucial method of interrogation. It is admittedly uncomfortable territory for anyone seeking to validate their view of Sasquatch as a large, undiscovered primate. Yet, despite reductionist opinions to the contrary, high strangeness persists unabated in the Bigfoot phenomena. On to the next one. We were camped at the American River National Forest Campground, and the morning we crossed the river behind camp and were hunting the ridge. This was in Kittitas County in Washington. We drove up this little game trail in my Bronco, too. That thing can go anywhere. Anyway, we came out on this giant cliff. There were four of us, my two sons and their friend. We hunted for about four hours, and my youngest and I decided to go back to camp and drive around and pick up the other kids. I left my guns with the two boys and went back with my youngest to camp, he carried a 30-30 Winchester. 
The walk back to camp was uneventful. We could see where the boys were, but couldn't get them by car, so we radioed them to go back to camp. I forgot to tell you that we had three radios. I carry one and each of the boys carry one. We then heard what we thought were elk coming up the cliffs. We sat and listened for a while and then went to investigate. On the way to the area of the noise, I noticed a tall, dark tree trunk in the bushes, but I kept going to the area that we thought the noise came from. We looked around and found no evidence of elk and decided to go back to the car. On the return trip, I noticed the tree trunk looked odd, so I asked my son for a 30-30 Winchester. I looked at the tree trunk, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was about 25 yards from it, and it looked like it had eyes, and they moved. My son said to come on back because he had seen it earlier, and said it was just a tree. We went back to the car, and he immediately locked the car door and told me to get the heck out of there. He had told me that it was a tree, because if the Bigfoot killed me, he would be next. He said he saw it move, and when its eyes moved, he said he almost went bananas. It was almost black, with a lot of gray hair. It was about six to seven feet tall, no neck, and very wide. I'm going back in the spring just to make sure it really wasn't a tree. I'm about 90% sure we saw what we saw, but there is still some doubt. My son is 100% sure he saw it. I wanted to go back and check it out further, but no one would come with me. By the time I talked my two sons into going back to look, the snow was too deep to get back in. On to the next one. This was off an old logging road in Grays Harbor County in Washington. I was deer hunting in mid-October. I was on an old logging road and was watching a cleared area for deer when, from across the draw, I observed someone come out of the tree line on the other side of the draw. At first, I thought it was a very large man as it seemed to move as one, walking quite comfortably as though it were strolling on a road. I'm aware of the roads in this area and was surprised to see that there was a road there. As I looked closer, I realized this person was far taller than a human and the strides while walking were quite long. It seemed to move along as though it had a hard, flat surface which is why I had the impression at first that there was a road there. It was a varied color of brown with what appeared to be a lighter, almost gray-brown head and shoulders giving the impression that it was mature. After observing for several seconds, it turned toward me as though it had just realized I was there and then turned back to the tree line and easily moved back into them. Still thinking that I couldn't have seen what I saw, I went across to the tree line where he entered, just sure I was going to find a road and a fellow hunter up there. I discovered no road and uneven, difficult ground cover. When I entered the trees where I saw this thing go into, I discovered that just through the trees was another draw, and that was very steep and unhikeable. Having never gave thought to Sasquatch possibilities before, I was truly amazed to find that I saw one. I was hunting with my son and a friend, but they were not in the area when I saw this. I am positive that I saw something definitely not human, but quite graceful on two legs. I was not sure if I should tell anyone of this as the thought of disbelievers and coming from a small made me a bit apprehensive. I did tell my hunting buddy and my son, but even took a few days to tell my wife. I feel honored to have been blessed with this sighting and have wanted to report it. Until now, I had let it slide, so to speak, but last night I saw a show on Sasquatch, and after seeing a film of one walking, it confirmed my belief that I truly saw what I saw. This, I swear, is true and sure. Only myself was there, and I was just sitting at the edge of the draw watching for deer. It was dry at the time. This is an area of partially logged fir and cedars with some old growth. There are no nearby structures, but there are creeks and some swampy areas. The area is full of steep draws that have been logged in the past 10 to 20 years and patches of wood. 
on to the next one. In Okanagan County in Washington, below a forest service tower, we were pretty remote. We have hunted there for 15 plus years and we're in a spooky surrounding that we haven't been in before. My friend and I were talking loudly for hunting and did not realize where we were. When we heard two or three loud screams that sounded like a thick cow, but a lot higher pitched and longer in length, we were stunned and, in fact, took cover behind a log. It seemed as it was coming toward us, very loud branches breaking and thumping. But just like that, it stopped, and we hightailed it out of there. I wish I could go there again, or I wish we would have looked at where this thing was coming from. It was early morning, the landscape was mostly pine cones, very dry dirt, and very dark surroundings. On to the next one. In Pierce County in Washington, four close friends and myself were camping at the base of Corral Path. Two of us have been believers for quite some time. The other three are staunch skeptics. On the second day of the outing, all five of us decided to go check out Corral Path. We all packed into my forerunner and off we went. By the time we got near the top, it was quite cold and snow-covered. We got out and plotted our hike. I immediately began looking for tracks, and within 15 minutes, we found some. They were bare, human-looking footprints, about 16 to 18 inches long by 8 to 10 inches wide, and the tracks were about 45 to 60 feet long, which trailed off into an unsnowed-on area. We've always been outdoorsmen and seen various animal tracks before, and we considered that maybe these were possibly tracks from, a, from huge boots, which melted outward some, then refroze, but then we noticed something that convinced all five of us on top of each print were a huge set of toes, but absolutely no claws. As I pointed this out to my buddies, they were speechless. We observed them individually, and in silence, as we were all really convinced, staring at each other with flat affect and big eyes. We continued on our trek quietly and didn't speak of it the rest of the trip. We've actually been squatching for about 10 years, and this has been our first visual of evidence. When you least expect it, I guess. The other witnesses were scouting out the area and decided what hiking route to take. Near the top of Corral Pass parking lot, about 400 yards indirectly in front of Honey Bucket. The area was a park-like setting, mountainside filled with wild, noble Christmas trees, berries of all sorts. There were ravines, a lake, and wildlife everywhere. On to the next one. In King County in Washington, I live in the Cascade foothills 10 miles east of Duval about 1,200 feet up. My husband and I had two very large footprints in our vegetable garden. They were perfect because the dirt was just tilled for spring planting. The space between the footprints was way too wide to be human. We didn't use plaster for an impression or get a picture, but we both know it was Bigfoot. My father-in-law saw them too and couldn't explain them. It's kind of neat to think a Bigfoot walked through our yard in front of our house. I wonder if they're up in the forest watching us work in the yard. We don't tell too many people because they think you're nuts. I'm pretty careful who I tell. It's been about four or five years now. I was getting ready to work in my veggie garden, and I noticed them and called my husband and father-in-law over. It was late morning on top of a foothill of the Cascade at a 1,200-foot elevation. Soft dirt in a vegetable garden, there's a major creek about 100 feet from there. On to the next one. This was near Snoqualmie Path in King County in Washington. I found two unknown animal footprints. One I stepped on and destroyed, and the other an obvious right foot. The print seemed a week or more old. The woods we walked through are very creepy. A swamp extends along the airstrip side 
and the river on the other. It's mostly dark and dank. I've never seen anything like this around here. It was along a log jam infested river bar on the south fork of the Snoqualmie River. We had come through a heavily forested area to a spot where a creek meets the river. A gravel bar extends some 500 yards downstream from this point and is about 150 yards wide. The airstrip is just above this area. There is a line of young alders that parallels the river with a sandy spot around the upstream end. The prints were coming from the direction of the forest. We had just come through and heading toward the river. The forest continued on the other side. We did not cross. There were other animal tracks, mostly deer and possible mountain lion tracks. We spend a lot of time each summer in this area. Usually we hang out and make sculptures, stack rocks, balance logs, etc. We were up for the first time this year to see if and how much the landscape had changed over winter. I had a camera and took several shots of the print. On to the next one. In Skamania County in Washington, my father and mother were vacationing in the Mount St. Helens area when Dad pulled over at a washed-out creek up past the Lava Canyon to videotape the creek where the explosion from St. Helens blast washed out the creek. He was videotaping on a small bridge where the road crossed the creek, narrating what he was seeing. He said while standing there taping, he could hear the beating of a stick on wood from the forest to the left and a return pounding from the stand of trees from the right. He progressed further onto the bridge to hear for sure that it was not an echo, which he was very confident it was not. Further, since it was midday on a weekday, traffic in the area was non-existent, and no people had been seen for miles around, nor were there any electrical lines in the area, nor work crews, nor loggers, nor hikers that would have been making these noises. My father is not easily scared, I mean that, and he was worried a bit for his safety at this point because of his certainty that the two separate noises were being generated in communication with one another, left, then right, then left at random spaces, not exceeding moments apart. He had the video camera rolling throughout the experience, and when I reviewed it, the pounding noises of wood on wood are audible on the tape, if somewhat indiscernible. I then interviewed my dad on my camera that evening to document the occasion. I might add that he said the stick being used to pound the trees or whatever was a heavy, thick stick that made a deeper sound than the crack of a small stick would make, hinting that the size of whomever were pounding must be considerable. Dad stopped rolling tape and got back in the idling truck fearing for his further safety. If memory serves, that June, we were experiencing many, many daily slight tremors around the St. Helen area, some ranging close to the three rivers on Richer. I'm of the mind that the Bigfoot is annoyed by the shaking of its habitat cave environment and is more suited to notice the low-frequency waves that are produced in tremors, as well as the smells of volcanic activity, and were probably driven out of their shelter midday by gases geothermal heat or vibration. Other witnesses were driving slowly along the road sightseeing. On to the next one. I was 15 years old. I come from a hunting and fishing family and started to enjoy the great outdoors from a very young age. I harvested my first deer at 10 years of age. My father was a decorated World War II Navy veteran. He was actually on the U.S. Yorktown and in charge of the engine room at the Battle of Midway. He retired as a Master Chief just to give you a little background about why I was raised to fear almost nothing. I think this also helps me to explain why I could never share this encounter with anyone, including my six older siblings. I was the youngest of seven. It was a brisk November day. My father and I were out deer hunting in what was then the U.S. Army Jefferson Proving Ground. It is now known as Big O Wildlife Preserve. 
My father and I had agreed upon ground stands and large trees that we would lean back against, which were big enough that if a stray shot slug happened to come your direction, the tree would stop it. I had sat at my tree since 5 a.m. At around 11 a.m., I ate the lunch that my mom had packed for me. It was a sunny day, and it had warmed up to probably the lower 50s. Like any teenager with a full stomach, I fell asleep. I'm not sure how much time had passed, but I was awoken by a rustling footstep in the dry oak leaves behind me. Thinking it was my dad coming to check on me, I leaned around the tree and froze. Not thirty feet from me stood an ape-like creature on two legs. It had hair that I can only describe as being the color of ripe wheat. It stood approximately nine and a half to ten feet tall. Its face was flat and was connected to what I guess you would describe as a high forehead. I did not get a great look at its eyes, but they seemed dark. I would guess its weight to have been somewhere between 400 to 450 pounds. I think it smelled the deer urine I had put down that morning, but with the weather warming up, the wind direction had changed. Thank God, because I know in my heart that if it would have seen me, my family would have never seen me again. I eased back around my tree and began to shake. I knew that the three 12-gauge slugs in my gun would do nothing to something that muscular, other than to simply piss it off. In a few minutes, its foot depth gradually drifted out of earshot, and I went to find my dad. I faked a stomachache, so that we could go home. Years afterward, I remember that every year we would have to go to a safety briefing before the hunt, and the colonel would always tell us, no cameras, and if you don't know what it is, don't shoot at it. Before, he would add, you don't want to know what's in here. I have never told another living soul this story, and even after all these years, I'm still shaking as I think back on it. On to the next one. I haven't told many people about my encounter, but it's just one of those things I've never been able to debunk. It took place shortly after school started in 2004, when I was seven or eight years old. My friend Travis, his older brother, and I were riding our dirt bikes at the dirt jumps, which still exist to this day. Suddenly, it started to storm. They left, but since my house was so close, and for reasons that I still don't remember, I hung out by myself. I guess I just wasn't ready to go. Off to the right, I saw this white figure moving slowly through the woods. It wasn't walking on a path, which I thought was strange. The first thing I noticed about the creature's physical appearance was that its arms stretched down to its waist, and that it didn't seem to have much of a neck. It never saw me, but it walked through the brush and passed a tree stand that was in front of me. I'd say it was about 50 or 60 feet from me. And I can accurately gauge the exact distance because both the tree stand and the jump I was sitting on top of are still there. Its shoulder came up to the platform of the tree stand, so I know it was taller than six feet, but it wasn't gigantic. Once it passed through, I rode my bike back to my house and told my gram about it. But of course, she brushed it off, and I didn't think too much about it. That is, until I was a few years older and saw a show about Bigfoot on TV. Since then, I've become pretty educated on the serious side of the Bigfoot community, and I strongly believe that what I saw was a young Bigfoot, or maybe just a shorter one. As for the color of its fur, it seemed really odd to me until I started hearing about other sightings of white Bigfoot across Pennsylvania. On to the next one. In Sussex County in New Jersey, my friend and I were about 11 years old. We have found some old Playboy books and were sitting on a big rock in the woods looking at them when we heard a dead tree fall over. 
we looked up and saw what we believed to be a Bigfoot. He was about eight or nine feet tall and was walking horizontal to us. It was walking from the right to left and was walking toward a small stream. It didn't seem to care about us, but we didn't stick around to find out. We ran out of the woods very quickly. We had a small dog with us that ran toward the creature, but later came back home with no problem. We got home and got our BB guns and a tape recorder and went back up to where we had the sighting. I guess we thought that we were going to be famous. We found no evidence. The next day in the paper, there was a front page article about footprints being found. I've heard animals screaming noises on a camp out about four miles away, but don't know if it has to do with the other. We dismissed it as a wounded animal. It did seem to circle the camp for a while, late at night from 2 to 4 a.m. at a high school senior camp out. On to the next one. In Manahawking, New Jersey, in Ocean County, in summer, I was riding my bike through the woods with some friends. I had to stop to wait for them. When I heard a branch snap, I glanced over. I was shocked and tried to figure out what I was looking at. No more than 40 feet away, it looked right at me with large black eyes. It was about eight to nine feet tall. I got a good look, too, I will never forget. He was proportioned the same way a human being would be. It was scary, with blackish-brown, rust-colored hair. The hair on his arms was about three to four inches long. His forearms were about the size around my legs, about 20 inches around. His strides were very long, say ten feet per step. He must have been watching me for some time, cause I was stopped already a minute. He just stared. No noise, no motion, no gestures, no nothing. I was very frightened, cause I didn't know what he was capable of. It was as if he was thinking of coming toward me. He was very close. I froze like a rock, turned my head to see what my friends were doing, then turned back to look at him, and he was still there. I know he got a good look at me, too, because it looked like he stooped his head down slightly and peered hard at me. Then he turned, raised his arm to gain his balance, and stepped into the wood. He didn't turn away from me, but rather walked to my left, his right, and I lost sight of him. I have told this story to many people, but I don't think anybody believed what I saw. I guess like I didn't believe either until I saw one with my own eyes. It was 9 a.m. on a Sunday in Pine Barren. On to the next one. In the winter, Robert Schneider, 15 years old, was at his uncle's house near Layton in Sandyson Township in Sussex County, New Jersey. He was alone at the time because a severe snowstorm trapped his father and his brother in Irvington. Around midnight, he began to hear a screaming noise off in the woods behind the house. He at first thought it was the howling of the wind. The screams seemed to be happening at intervals every few minutes and were getting closer. The witness was so rattled by this that he went to the garage and let Molly, his uncle's German shepherd dog, into the main house where she was normally never allowed. The dog was also spooked by the noises and they spent the next few hours huddled together near the fire until the screaming finally faded away. On to the next one. In Passaic County in New Jersey, I saw the lower half of a Bigfoot when driving home from work. It was just getting dark and was on Skyline Drive. I came around a bend in the road and caught a glimpse of the hips and two hairy legs walking across the road. Definitely not a human. It took one step from the center of my lane and with one step, not a run, was over the sideline and into the woods. I was about 19 at the time. No one believes me to this day. I was told by my mom about a year later that the cars that were always parked on top of the mountain was a Bigfoot research team. Makes sense. 
on to the next one. In Burlington County in New Jersey, I heard very loud screams. The screams were louder than anything I ever heard in my life. They did not sound like any animal or bird I have ever heard. Every hair on my body was standing on end. I heard it walking around my tree stand less than 50 yards away. I thought it was a deer or my hunting partner coming over until it started screaming. I was in a climbing tree stand and opted to jump out rather than shimmy down because I did not want to lower my bow to the ground. It followed me all the way out of the woods to the road I was parked on. When I came out on the road, my hunting partner was standing on the roof of my car with his bow drawn back. He could not get into the car because I had the keys in my pocket. It was making loud stepping sounds unlike a small animal. There was one witness besides myself. It was dusk, right after sunset. Cool night with a bright moonlight. Myself and two others had heard the same noise in the same location the following year. It was thick pine wood. On to the next one. On Cemetery Hill Road in Washington in Warren County, New Jersey. It was spring and I was driving around some country roads with a friend listening to music when the tape jammed. I pulled over to fix it, but left the car running and the headlights on. I looked up from the tape and saw the bushes moving on the opposite side of the road. I assumed it was a deer. I was wrong. I started to fix the tape again when my buddy said, What the heck is that? I looked up to see a very large, gray-haired creature stepping out of the bushes. It walked on two legs like a man, was around 500 or 600 pounds, and stood over seven feet tall. I'm basing the height on my buddy who was with me, who was six foot eight. It walked out into the road about 15 yards in front of us, just stopped and looked at us for a few seconds, then just walked across the road into the woods and started up a hill. It had human-like hands, feet, and a face covered in long gray hair. It was 11 or so p.m. on a clear night. My headlights illuminated it completely in a rural wooded area. I had heard of another sighting about eight miles away in Manfield Township. On to the next one. Two fishermen were returning home from Franklin section of the Newark watershed in Sussex County in New Jersey. And as they were driving down a dirt road, they saw a strange creature cross the road through their headlight beam. They slammed on the brake and tried to follow it down a path until their station wagon got bogged. The hairy humanoid was six and a half feet tall and appeared to weigh 300 pounds and was covered all over in reddish brown hair. Its face was flat and it had ears like a man. It was hunched when it moved and swung its arms with its fists clenched. The witnesses had got to five feet from the creature and were certain it was not a bear or a man in an ape suit. On to the next one. Canoe stated that they had been followed by a creature moving through the underbrush along the Mullica River. A month later, a group of young women in their early 20s had a reunion with a camping trip in the pine trees just outside Waretown in Ocean County, New Jersey. They spent a night in terror as something thrashed around in the woods outside their tent while peering at them with bright red eyes. On to the next one. In Burlington County in New Jersey, when I was 14, I was camping in Wharton State Forest, north of Hampton Furnace. I was alone. Just before dark, I was out walking. I became aware that something was shadowing me back in the brush. It followed me to camp and began to circle. It was very stealthy. It circled while I cooked and got ready for the night. I finally crawled in the tent and tried to sleep. After a while, I heard a faint sound behind me. I was about to look out the back window when the thing started screaming. I have never heard anything that loud 
in the wood. The volume was like a car horn up close. People tell me it was an owl. Well, I have heard lots of owls, and they can't even come close. I lay there for a long time, too scared to move. I thought I heard it moving closer, and I started screaming. It just stopped and walked off. After a very long night, I packed up at first light and got out of there. The area behind the tent was covered in pine needles, and I had no desire to look in the brush for tracks. I once found human tracks in mud in the winter. They were no longer than ten inches, but very broad. At the time, I thought some nut was running around in the winter in their bare feet. The tracks were very wide. It was dusk, about two hours after dark. There was a bog on one side and a swamp on the other. The following is a collection of wildman accounts from the turn of the century that share remarkable similarities to modern-day Sasquatch and Bigfoot accounts. Veritable wild man in the mountains of Portland. Much excitement has been created in the neighborhood of Lebanon recently over the discovery of a wild man in the mountains above that place who is supposed to be the long-lost John McIntyre. About four years ago, McIntyre of Lebanon, while out hunting in the mountains of East Albany with another man, mysteriously disappeared, and no definite trace of him has ever since been found. A few days ago, Mr. Fitzgerald and others, while hunting in the vicinity of the butte known as Bald Peter, situated in the Cascades, several miles above any settlement, saw a man resembling the long-lost man entirely destitute of clothing, who had grown hairy as an animal, and was a complete wild man. He was eating the raw flesh of a deer when he was first seen, and they approached within a few yards before he saw them and fled. Isaac Banty saw this man in the same locality about two years ago. It is believed by many that the unfortunate man who was lost became deranged and managed to find means of substance while wandering about in the mountains, probably finding shelter in some cave. A party of several men is being organized to go in search of the man. The 97-year-old man who cracks nuts with his teeth and chops wood Saturday is slow in showing up this season. He was due in Douglas County on the 1st. The wild woman is on time. She has been heard from near Philomath. It is alleged that she was seen at Wood Schoolhouse in Blodgett Valley, June 29th, picking up crumbs where children had eaten dinner. And on the 30th, she attempted to seize a little girl about 20 feet from the schoolhouse. The teacher being called ran to the window to get, if possible, a view of her face, but did not succeed, for she bounded away like a wild animal. A wild man has been seen several times of late in the vicinity of John Obenchains near Big Butte, Jackson County. He is naked and takes to the woods every time he sights a human being. The nearest he was seen to the haunt of a human being was at a county schoolhouse where it was supposed he was prowling around for some waste lunches left by the school children. A sheep herder brought in the report Monday from the John Day that a veritable wild man of the woods had been seen near sheep camps in that section. Several people have run across him, it is said, but as is customary with wild men, he has always disappeared at their approach. The reported presence of the creature has caused much excitement up there, and an organized attempt may be made to capture him, which should be encouraged by the Robinson Circus Management. For some time, rumors have reached us, says the Vale, Malchester County Gazette, about a wild man ranging between Bella and Harper Ranch. But not within the last few days have the report gained currency. How and when the stranger came, no one seems to know. Ranch hands have heard strange noises among the willows or the wild wail of a human blended with the lone yelps of some coyotes. Last Thursday, the doubtful clouds were dissipated from the minds of the skeptical. Among the other hands that went to work Thursday morning 
on the Harper Ranch was Floyd Garrison with a team of mules who started to mow the lower field. He had not been gone long when he was seen coming toward the house at a breakneck speed and, with team foaming and a face as white as chalk, proceeded to tell his story. He had not gone but a round or two when he was aroused by a series of incoherent yells, and out of the brush came the form of a man with scanty a rag about his loins, his eyes wild and protruding from their socket, and his emaciated body was covered with short, dark hair. On seeing Garrison, he turned and, with an agonizing scream, fled through the brush. As of yet, no steps had been taken to capture him. Astoria, Oregon. The residents of John Day Precinct in this county report that an insane man has been seen in the woods there, running about in an almost nude state. He is described as being six feet tall with long black hair and whiskers. He will allow no one to approach him and, when surprised, seeks cover in the brush. How he subsists is a mystery, as none of the settlers have any idea where he obtains food. A trapper who has been hunting and trapping on the Malheur River south of the Agency Valley this winter reports to the Vale Advocate one of those prodigies of nature known as a wild man. The advocate says the biped is of giant stature, being at least seven feet high, having long and massive arms that reach to its knees, while the whole body is covered with curly, glossy hair. Astoria, Oregon. Lake Moore, a young logger living about 10 miles south of this city, was killed about 4.30 this afternoon while aiding the county authorities in an effort to apprehend Matt Hillstrom, a crazy logger. The demented man labored under the hallucination that the woods were full of gorillas and three times this week attempted to kill L. R. Amber Crombie, a neighbor. Twice, Mrs. Hillstrom quieted her crazy spouse, but this morning he watched for Abercrombie on a road and took a shot at him. The bullet did not miss Abercrombie's head by more than an inch. Abercrombie then came to the city and acquainted the county authorities with the situation. Deputy Sheriff Tillinger and Constable Wickman left for the house. On the way out, they met young Moore, who agreed to accompany them and point out Hilsom's abode. When they reached the place Moore suggested, it would be better that he should go to the door as he was acquainted with the crazy man. Mrs. Hillstrom appeared in response to a knock at the door. Moore asked him where Hillstrom was, and he had no sooner uttered the word than the report of a rifle rang out. Moore staggered backward with a groan and fell dead. The body lay only a few feet from the door, and the officers deemed it folly to attempt to recover it as Hillstrom would doubtlessly shoot them when they appeared in sight. Constable Wickman remained at the place while Deputy Tillinger hurried in the launch to the city. A posse left at once for the scene, and the house is now surrounded. Further bloodshed is feared when the effort to get him from the house is made. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email submissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye! I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, 
So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!